other country music folks. So inside here, when you come in, you will see that this is Hank Snow. He was the first inductee to the Nova Scotia Country Music Hall of Fame. And this was his, uh, his actually his plaque. And um, Hank Snow was the first and Wolf Carter was the second. And on the other side of this is Wolf Carter. But I'll show you some things here. We have a tribute, if you come over here and look. We have a tribute for Hank Snow every year on the third weekend of August. And the first one was in Somerville Beach in 1991. We outgrew that the first year we were there. There were so many people, we had to go to Caledonia. We outgrew that and we had to go to Bridgewater. And then now we've come to Liverpool. But this is a compilation. A lady did this for us. These are all of the shirts. We make t-shirts every year at the Hit Tribute. And she took all those shirts and she made it into a beautiful quilt. So we have it behind glass here because we want to preserve it. But this lovely lady did it. And if you look up there, it says the 25th anniversary, the Hank Snow Tribute T-shirt quilt. Mm -hmm. And it was donated by the family in memory of Lottie Levy. And she knew Hank Snow and her daughter, Jeanette uh, Macaloni, who was a longtime fan and regularly attended the Hank Snow tribute. So this is what this is in aid of the, uh, this lady made it in honor of those folks. So that was pretty nice. We have some things here as well. We have something from Aaron Perchette. Um, of course, Lucille Starr. Mm -hmm. You will see Lucille Starr was, of course, one of the Canadian sweethearts, uh, along with her husband. And Hank Snow uh, helped her in her career. And she gave us this beautiful jacket. And you'll see she has it on in, in one of her photos. And it's always lovely to be able to say that uh, we have Lucille Stars. This is from Carolyn Don Johnson, and a lot of you will know her. And she brought us her, her uh, pants and sh shirt that she was using when she was uh, over at the Astor Theater. And as did Aaron Prochette when he was over at the Astor Theater. This particular, uh, this particular guitar, we can't authenticate that, that it was Hanks. We don't know, but somebody said it was Hanks. We put it here because we just, someone donated it. We're not sure about that. But here we have the Rainbow Ranch boys brought us their, their part of their outfits. Now, I want to tell you something. I told you about the tribute that we have every year. In the, well, for years and years, these folks, the uh, Rainbow Ranch boys came here and played behind all the people who were at the tribute. Mm. They would come, I know, can you imagine if we were from Ecom Seacom and you're playing at the tribute and behind you are Hank Snow's Rainbow Ranch boys. It was quite an honor mm -hmm. for us to have them come every year. Uh, they're all dead now except for one and that is the guy in the middle there. His name is Roger Carroll and Roger is the guy, the tall guy in the back. Mm. And I'll tell you a story about Roger Carroll. It's pretty interesting. What happened was they were playing at the Opry on the Friday night. On Wednesday, Hank's bass player quit and went with Lefty Brazel. Mm. And so Hank said to, uh, if you'll see there, the guy with the steel guitar is Caton Roberts. And he was a wonderful man. He came here and played, always played behind everybody at the, at the tribute. He was a wonderful man. And he said to Kate, we need a, a bass player for Friday night at the, at the Opry. Now you realize the Opry, Hank is a big star now. And so Kate says, you know what? My, my son plays in a band here in Nashville and they have a really good bass player. Hank said, well, ask them to come and try out tomorrow night. So that's what he did. Well, anyway, Roger told me the story. He comes here to visit and he was, he was really funny. He said, 20 years in, he said, what happened was, I said, Mr. Snow, I can't, am I a member of your band yet? He said, I came to try out 20 years ago. And Hank Snow looked at him and said, keep trying. You're doing really good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but can you imagine a young teenager playing at the opera behind yeah. a big star like Hank Snow? Yeah. He said it was such a thrill. He couldn't believe it. He said, I couldn't believe I was on the Opry stage playing. You know, mm -hmm. he said, I've been there many times looking at mm -hmm. people. So that was pretty wonderful to have that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's why we have these here because they brought these when they came here to, uh, to perform. This is an outfit of Hank's that we got at auction. Now, I'll just tell you that these are some of Hank's you can see from here. Mm -hmm. These are some. I love this one. Mm -hmm. And if you'll notice, here it is up here, there. 
And I always loved that one, and I really wanted that one. It's, he's in this right here. But I, we didn't get it. But we did get this one. Mm -hmm. This one is here, right here. So all of these that you see here, everything that you see here, uh, we got at auction. We bought at auction. This one in particular is very, very heavy. It's very ornate. Um, Nudie, and that's a guy that did all things for Porter Wagner and all those guys, he is the guy who did these. His, his company uh, did all of this. It's very intricate. All of the, the, the really beautiful crystals and things on them are, are quite unique. Now, I don't know if you have seen the movie Elvis. No? Well, for 20 some years, I've been telling everybody uh, the story. And now somebody has put it in film. I could have made a lot of money if I had done that. But anyway, I read it in Hank's book. And, and Hank doesn't have anything bad to say about anybody in his book except for one person, and that is Tom Parker. And what happened was Tom Parker and Hank were in a, I would say it would be a, a pro promotion company for musicians. And, and I'll tell you the other part of the story is that Elvis and uh, Jimmy Rogers Snow, Hank's son, were best friends. And Jimmy Rogers was here, and uh, Jimmy, Roger, J Jimmy Snow was here, and he said to me, he said, I'll tell you, we were hellions. He said, imagine my father gave me a convertible Cadillac to drive around Nashville. And Elvis and I were friends, and we drove, we said we were Hellions. He said, what happened was, I told my father, I said, you know, Elvis has got some, a little record here. And his father said, you know what, we should get him to, to perform. And he said, no, his parents won't let him. So uh, Hank and uh, Tom were talking about it. Hank said, well, look, I'm a down-home guy. Let me go and talk to the parents, which he did. And they said yes. So he came back, he said to Tom Parker, he said, listen, Tom, he said, I spoke with the Presleys. They said yes. They said yes. Um, he, he, they would let him. So he said, can you get the contract signed? Tom said, yes, I will. Two days later, Hank said, I read this in his book, said, I, um, did you get a chance to go and uh, speak to the Presleys? He said, well, yes, I did, Hank. Only one thing. I had them sign the contract in my name, not in ours. That's how Tom Parker got Elvis. It wasn't very nice. And as I say, that's the only person that Hank had something not nice to say about and, and never, ever did like him. Um, it's interesting because uh, Hank still helped Elvis. He took him to the Opry. He did stuff with him. And of course, that's because he was his son's best friend. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting about mm -hmm. that, too. And Jimmy mentioned this. He said, you know, years later, Jimmy got saved and he became a preacher. And of course, at that time, Elvis was big. And of course, also, everybody was uh, against Elvis and the way he, you know, down south, way he was, you know, uh, way he danced on stage and stuff. And so did Jimmy. So Jimmy preached against his best friend <laughs> years later. So it was very interesting. And Jimmy said, you know, times were different then, that's for sure. Yeah. But anyway, it was always interesting to see that story. Now, I don't know if you can think about it, but Hank Snow came from this, and he was an abused child. He started an international foundation for abused and neglected children. Um, he left them uh, millions of dollars uh, when he died. Um, and it's because he was an abused child. Now, when they decided that they were going to make a museum, they called him up. They said, um, Hank, we were thinking of making a museum. You know, you've done so much, and we'd love to honor you. He said, oh, that's really wonderful. Thank you very much. They said, and we think we might be able to get the train station. And right away, he said, in Liverpool? Really? It showed up? And they said, yes. He said, it was my safe place when I was a child. So imagine we have this place that was his safe place. That's because his parents were divorced. Things were different in those days. You know, the, the wife had to go out to, to work. Uh, the children, two of the other children went into service, the older girls. Um, they were like 10 and 11. They still were put out to to look at son's house to work. The youngest one went into foster care. Hank was taken by his father to his grandparents, and he stayed there. His grandmother was very, very nasty to him. She was not a nice lady, um, and she beat him terribly. She wouldn't have him even say his mother's name, and he loved his mother. Um, so Hank, you'll see the train tracks outside the window there, and they come from Brooklyn, those train tracks. And that's where Hank used to come when he was a child. And he would come down those train tracks there, out there, 
and he would come down, was uh, actually she was working in Liverpool. She was working in the home of a pharmacist. She was actually their housekeeper. So he used to walk down these tracks. He would come up to Liverpool. He would, his mother didn't get off till nine o'clock at night. He would lay in the grass outside of his mother's place and he would then proceed to go home. And he was afraid to go home because he knew, and I'll show you this lady here, over here. If you look over here, this particular lady was his grandmother. And that's his father's mother. And she was uh, very nasty. She beat him quite severely um, several times over the years that he was there. And the thing was, she wouldn't let him say his mother's name, and he loved his mother. So as I say, he would come up the train tracks, he would go up, and he would wait for his mother to get off. And as I say, she was working as a housekeeper for a pharmacist in Liverpool. And when she got off, they would visit. So it would be like 9.30, 9, 9.30 at night when she got off. Then when he started to go home, he knew he was going to get beat. And he said what he would do was, he would come in here to the train station, and there was a bench outside, and he would lay on the bench and he would not get beat. He would lay there because he knew he'd get a beating when he went home. So anytime he needed a safe place, he would come in here. So it became his safe haven. Yeah. So it's such a wonderful idea that we were able to have this train station to be his, uh, actually to be the museum for Hank Snow because yeah. it was his safe haven. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as I said, he started that international foundation. After Hank died, um, well, it would be in the year 2000. I was here, actually. Um, and his wife came in. His wife's name was Min. And she brought us all of this all of this stuff. The things that you see here, she brought us all of this. Mm -hmm. And you will see the beautiful handwriting that Hank Snow had. That is a guy who had less than grade 5 education. And I say that because he went out on a trawler to the Grand Banks. He said it was absolutely horrible. He said the, the, the place was horrible. He said he had on these wetsuits, and he said the legs, he had to roll them up about eight times, the arms, the same thing. They were still too big for him. He was a little guy. Mm -hmm. But the reason he went was because, I'll tell you, he was only beaten by his grandmother. But after his mother remarried, she had him come to live with him, and his stepfather beat him. And he's a little guy. Now, I know that people say that he was uh, had grade five education, but I'm sure that he probably didn't because trawlers wouldn't go out in the summer. They went out in the winter, and that's when he went out to the, and he said he went to the Grand Banks, and that is, it would be horrible. He said it was a terrible trip. But anyhow, he, he did do that, and they didn't get paid. They were deck boys, and what they did was they would be able to, when they got up to close to land, they could fish. Then they would go on the shore and they would sell their fish, and that's how he bought his guitar. Yeah. He sold his fish on land. Um, he said it was it was it was really really horrible thing to have to do. Now, at Min, his wife brought us these things. We did buy this at, at an auction. But I'm saying, going to tell you to have a look at this beautiful painting. Mm -hmm. He actually painted that. He oh. was an artist. Oh. And we couldn't believe it when we saw it. So when she went home, she took pictures of those other. Uh, actually they were on her wall and she took those for us and we were so excited because oh, beautiful can you imagine that he was he was that talented mm -hmm. this yeah. is a guy as i say didn't have much of an education but the very early uh, revenue that he got from uh, his singing down in nashville he bought this land here and you'll see that this is his house and he never moved from there he could have. He had millions of dollars. He could have been in a, a much bigger place. But he was in Madison, Tennessee, and that's some of the pictures of the inside of his house. And he actually put in a pool outside and that sort of thing. But he had the ranch because, of course, he had Shawnee. And Shawnee, his horse, was at the Rainbow Ranch and uh, lived there until he was 31 or 32, mm -hmm. I think, before he died. Mm -hmm. And he had lots of dogs and cats, and he buried them all in his land because he had farmland in behind. And that is still there in Madison, Tennessee. And Hank's great nephew bought it from the estate. And so he's made it into an Airbnb. So it is, uh, you can go there and stay. And it's, he's done a really great job on it. So it's always nice. And I don't know if you know or not, but 
these uh, folks, um, when he was on tour, Irving Oil, or Mr. Irving, Mr. Irving, the original, loved Hank Snow. Now, if you look over here, and I'll show you if you can come over here with me, they have uh, a, some of the Irving Oil sponsors. You can see the Irving Oil Country Days, and uh, he sponsored Hank Snow, he sponsored Carol Baker. He gave Hank that uh, beautiful shirt with Irving on it. Also, he gave Hank Snow the very first Irving Oil credit card, and it had Hank Snow on it. Hank. So, you know, if you see what an impact Hank Snow had on people, and Mr. Irving loved him and loved his music, so that was really wonderful. So, I don't know if I, if I told you or not, but if you come over here, you will see over here, that we have a gown from St. Mary's University. Hank Snow was honored by St. Mary's University. He was given a doctor of letters. He was very proud of that. Um, this is a guy who didn't even have grade five education, but he was absolutely uh, wonderfully uh, talented. Now, of course, he didn't always speak like we hear him on Tales of the Yukon, where his diction is completely perfect. He was, if you look over here, he was with CHNS right here, and that's from CHNS, and that's in Halifax. And he had a little 10 minute program at CHNS, and it was sponsored by a flower company. And that is where he had to wait before he went on the air. And there was a guy who did the, um, well, it would be the, I guess, news, weather, and sports. And Hank was listening to him one day, and he said, that's how I want to speak. And he taught himself how to speak like that. His diction in any of his recitations is, is perfect. The songs that he wrote have got beautiful wording in them. And of course, that's because Hank Snow taught himself. You know, he was a self-taught man. And certainly, um, we can hardly believe that he came from this area, you know, when you, when you really think about it. So that's why it's really important to see how this man... Uh, just how much he did. Now, you're wondering about this dress here that we have here. Mm -hmm. Well, his wife, Min, was a very accomplished seamstress. She was from Halifax. She was an Alders from Fairview and Halifax. Her brothers actually, at some point in time, sang and played with them. Um, they're a very family, family. She made this dress. She was really, really talented. And if you see in there, um, there's a picture of her in the newspaper with that dress on at Hank's 25th year with RCA Victor. That was in 1961. Isn't that amazing? And Chet That's Atkins awesome. is there and A.H. And, uh, Joseph and Steve Scholes, all people that everybody knows. Hank was well known in the industry. He was well loved in the industry. He was, of course, a very particular person. Um, he expected everything to be done in a right way, and that's how we have all those wonderful records because that's what he did. He made sure that they were done. He didn't mind practicing, he didn't mind um, any of that, but no one in his band was allowed to drink because once he became famous, and I'm not saying that he, he was like that all the time because one time we had some folks here from Picto and, and Cape Breton, and uh, they were there, and one guy said to me, you know, Hank Snow was in jail, in Picto County Jail, with my uncle. I said, oh yeah. He said, yeah. So I got the book out, because that book, the Hank Snow story, tells you everything. I get in, I look through, sure enough, there it is. I was drunk and disorderly in Picto County Jail. I went, okay, so his uncle was real. <laughs> Another time, I don't know if you've seen this, but this is Shawnee, right, his trick horse. Oh. He trained Shawnee, and Shawnee was absolutely fantastic. He could do so much stuff, it was unbelievable. He lived till he was over 30 years old. Well, this man was here, and he told me when he was a child, he was down in, in central Nova Scotia in, a, in the backwoods, and they had a community center. And he said they asked Hank Snow to come. He said it was packed, there were all kinds of people there. He said, I was a little child, and he said, we were excited, you know, because he had his horse, and he had, you know, so it was a station wagon, and the guys were taking the gear out, and they were putting it in there. And he said, Hank was taking the horse out. And some guy who worked at the place came running out and saying, no, 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 you can't bring your horse in here. And Hank said, well, it's part of the show. No, nope, can't bring the horse in here. Hank said, no, no, the horse, Shawnee, is part of our show. No, nope, can't bring him in here. Hank said, boys, bring your gear back. He said, put the horse in. He said, and they drove off. He said, there was 